The South American jungle is a hidden world, full of strange and mysterious animals. The Amerindians believe that a giant water dog lives here. The Spanish conquistadors thought a huge wolf had left the forest to rule the rivers. An unearthly wail proclaims the arrival of this king of the water world. It's the cry of a giant otter. is the largest of its kind. A mature male can measure nearly two and a half meters, over twice the length of its largest relative. It's also the world's rarest otter. Because of its great size and the quality of its velvety fur, the pelt was in great demand for coats and handbags in Europe during the early 1900s. Today, in spite of protection by law, the trade continues. Plenty money. Plenty money. Come by money. The giant otter once ranged throughout Amazonian America, but loss of habitat, river pollution, and hunting have taken a heavy toll. close family units of as many as 30 individuals. But to see a large group like this one is a rare privilege today. Their bold behavior makes them easy targets for hunters. Probably no more than a thousand giant otters left, and they're found only in isolated areas of the South American interior. One such place is the Rupununi region in southwest Guyana. Guyana means land of many waters. The rainforest and savannas are crisscrossed by a network of rivers and creeks. rapids and waterfalls, such as Kaiachua, at 234 meters, the highest single drop fall in the world, make the rivers unnavigable and keep hunters at bay. Giant otters have been exterminated in most of their former range. The Guyanas, Suriname, and isolated pockets of Peru are their last strongholds.
In Guyana, there is a handful of people who are deeply concerned about the otter's plight. Diane McTurk has a large ranch in the heart of the Rupununi Plains. She's trying to protect the otters living on her land and devotes much of her time to rearing orphaned cubs. Every day she takes her cubs for a swim in the Rupununi River. She hopes that eventually these youngsters will return to the wild. In the meantime, she tries to be a surrogate mother, teaching them the skills they'll need in the natural environment. Come there, miss. Come, Samira, where are you? Where is Samira? Come, you, come, you, my little baby, in my heart, in my soul. Come with me. What you do? <laughs> come, baby. Come, baby. I got that baby again. Come here, Rufus, baby. Come here, Rufus, and then. Well, what you want is your is your lunch. You want your lunch. Beast. Diane's grandparents were pioneer settlers. The Makusi Indians have lived here for thousands of years. And until recently, they've had little effect on the wildlife. Fish from the river and cassava, which they make into bread, are still their staple diet. But foreigners have introduced new commodities, among which alcohol and tobacco are the most popular. Few Indians live off the land today. Many of them are employed by settlers. They spend their wages on clothes, food and drink. Money has changed their culture and way of life. Among other things, it has given them a reason to kill rare wild animals to sell their skins. The otters are under another kind of pressure from the Indians. Like most people, the Makusi are fond of keeping pets, as well as dogs and cats. They take in a variety of wild animals, including parrots, monkeys, and giant otters. Otter cubs are delightful, but difficult and demanding to rear. When the youngsters become sick or weak, the Indians tire of them and take them to Diana. The Indians illegally catch cubs to sell them. The people who buy them encourage the market, and the pressure on the species continues. Even in capable hands, their chances are slim. The cubs are weak or even dying by the time Diane takes them in. In the jungle, it's difficult to obtain a suitable milk substitute or antibiotics. Come, babies, come, creatures. Come, Jess. Neither of these baby otters is alive today. One died of an infection, and the other was clubbed to death by an Indian for chasing chickens. Giant otters rarely threaten livestock, but they do compete with the Indians for fish. Among the Makusi, skilled fishermen hold a highly respected position in society. When the first settlers arrived, bringing metal fish hooks, the Indians learned to catch small fish with a hand line. 
True to popular belief, South American rivers teem with piranha. Their reputation for stripping flesh from bone in minutes makes them one of the most feared fish in the world. They are the only fish the Indians kill before retrieving their hook. Their razor-edged teeth could remove a careless finger. The Makusi still use the traditional bow and arrow to hunt large fish and any other animal which comes within range. An otter pelt is worth $15 on the black market. That's two weeks agricultural wages. The large webbed footprints are easy to track in the soft mud. The Makusi are among the most skillful hunters in the world. They can move silently through the bush in pursuit of their quarry. An unexpected encounter with a peccary diverts their attention away from the otter. This South American wild pig is prized for its meat. A peccary is worth more to the Indian than an otter. pig is lost to the river. The Indians are reluctant to wade into these waters. A disturbance in the stream shows that the piranha have detected the scent of blood. They don't entirely deserve their fearsome reputation and some of the stories about them are pure legend. Others are true. When the carcass snags on a drowned tree, the fish close in. At first they're cautious, gingerly circling the food, but as their confidence increases, the water around the peccary will become a mass of snapping jaws. In half an hour, the pig will be reduced to bones. An aquatic mammal's chance of survival in these waters might seem slim, but in spite of their reputation, piranha usually attack only dead or dying animals. A healthy otter is too fast and agile for them to catch. It's the fish which need to beware. They're among the giant otter's favorite prey. Although otters live in close family groups, they never share their catch. They guard it jealously, warning others to keep their distance. This otter has caught a large black piranha, about 60 centimeters long and weighing about three kilos. Like the Indians, otters handle these fish with caution. They usually eat their prey head first, but they leave a piranha's jaws until last. Small fish swarm around the feeding animal, scavenging for scraps. Each otter can eat about 10 kilos of fish every day. It's this enormous appetite that brings giant otters into conflict with the fishermen.
piranha are bony to eat, but they're plentiful and they taste good. The rivers are full of fish and predators like the giant otter have little effect on their numbers. People, however, are beginning to upset the balance. The Indians now use nets to catch fish. They're effective but indiscriminating and therefore wasteful. These men have caught more than they need. They throw out unpalatable species, fish that have spoilt in the sun. When fish stocks fall, it's the otters, not the fishermen, who take the blame. The fishing expedition has not gone unnoticed. Vultures are constantly on watch for the chance of a meal. Vultures have a vital role in keeping the land clear of rotting flesh. Their scavenging helps to reduce the risk of disease. There are two common species in Guyana. The black vulture locates food by sight. The more aggressive turkey vulture relies on its keen sense of smell. The squabbling birds and the smell of rotting fish attract the attention of one of the most formidable residents of these rivers. It's a black cane. Cayman are South American alligators. They can reach more than six meters. This one is nearly full grown. They're reputed to be the fastest crocodilians in the world. They're quite capable of catching their own food, but they'll scavenge when the opportunity arises. It's not surprising that otters here have evolved to such a great size with such large and ferocious neighbors. When a distant caterwauling announces the arrival of an otter, the caiman sinks below the surface. These huge reptiles can't challenge the giant otter's sheer speed and agility in the underwater world.
It's February in Guyana. There's been no rain for three months. The Rupununi savannas and the flooded forest have almost dried out. A few isolated pools are the only wet areas left. As the water level falls, the fish become concentrated in the pools. The otters are quick to exploit this ready supply of food. They search for fish sheltering beneath the lily pads, which like the otters grow to a giant size here. Some of the leaves are more than two meters across. Giant otters are diurnal and they hunt mainly by sight. In muddy water, however, they use their whiskers to detect small movements of nearby fish. Like all other otters, they're particularly fond of eels. There are red piranha trapped here too. Replete, the otters relax in the shallows. Play is the privilege of animals fortunate enough not to have to seek food all their waking hours. In the dry season, surrounded by a captive larder, the otters have plenty of spare time. They're not alone in exploiting this seasonal surfeit of food. Several species of kingfisher fly in to join the feast. This is an immature Amazon kingfisher. When the water level has fallen to a few centimetres, great flocks of egrets, storks and ibis gather at the receding edges of the pools. Fish stranded in the shallows make easy pickings. When there are no fish left, the birds will fly on to another shrinking pool. The otters, meanwhile, head back to the river along trails made by forest animals. On land, the giant otter is clumsy and vulnerable to attack from its only natural enemy, the jaguar.
jaguar is scarce now in the forests of South America, but where it survives, it's a formidable predator. High in the canopy, a tyra is safely out of reach. The Indians call it the tree otter. It's closely related to the giant otter. Both species belong to the weasel family. But the tyra lives in the treetops and rarely ventures to the ground. The jaguar moves on to hunt more accessible prey. The agouti lives on the forest floor, where it searches for fallen fruit. It's a large rodent, hunted by wild cats, bush dogs, and also by Indians. Prey to so many hunters, it's wary of the slightest sound. But the giant otter is no cause for alarm. It's too slow and clumsy on land to catch an agouti, and its prime concern is to hurry back to the safety of the river. The creek water is tea-coloured, stained by acids leaching from rotting leaves. Once in the water, the otter is again in its element, moving with consummate grace. A giant otter is extremely inquisitive by nature. An anaconda this size could constrict and swallow an otter. Nevertheless, it has to be investigated. Like a mongoose, the otter is quick enough to keep out of striking distance. It will eat small snakes, but this is surely a little overambitious. curiosity satisfied, the otter moves on. The water level in the river can drop six meters by the end of the dry season. Sandbanks appear, 
trapping fish in the shallows. The otters are quick to take advantage. The pool are a nursery for baby caiman. There's plenty of fish for them to eat, but with little cover, the reptiles are vulnerable to predators, including the giant otter. Baby caiman are evidently good to eat, but they're tricky to catch. They have sharp teeth which can penetrate even an otter's thick pelt. Cayman puts up a fight, but a diminutive reptile is no match for a giant otter. Most of the baby caimans will survive. They're just not worth the effort. Even piranha are an easier option. Dean McTurk's close acquaintance with giant otters provided some fresh insights into their lives and their chances of survival into the 21st century. Giant otters pair for life. When they're not fishing or sleeping, they're invariably playing. Play reinforces the partnership and the two animals become inseparable. Giant otters are the most vocal of all otters, with an extraordinary repertoire of snorts, huffs and sneeze-like grunts, ranging to loud, penetrating screams and wails. Each family claims its own stretch of river, usually between two and four kilometers long. Within their territory, the otters excavate a number of chambers in the riverbank, known as holts, where they rest during the day and sleep at night. Giant otters take great care to scent mark their territory with urine and strong-smelling droppings called spraint. There's always a spraint site near each holt, usually on the bank above it. The scent informs other giant otters that the area is occupied and probably enables them to determine the owner's age, sex and breeding condition. Giant otters have been known to breed at all times of year, but most cubs are born during the dry season. When the river is low, the breeding holt is unlikely to be flooded, and with fish concentrated in shallow water, there's no shortage of food. These cubs are six weeks old. Their eyes have opened, but like all babies, they still need a lot of sleep.
They're independent enough to be left alone for short periods, but their parents return every few hours to check on their well-being. At about this age, the adults introduce their offspring to the world outside. One parent surveys the river first to make sure that there are no jaguar or passing Indians nearby. Either might take the babies. When it's sure the coast is clear, it returns to collect its young. The adults confidently enter the water and head upstream, encouraging the cubs to follow. But for a baby otter, the river is a strange new world where the unknown lurks around every corner. <laughs> Finding themselves alone, the parents pause a while, waiting for their young to catch up. Otter cubs are not the water babies one might expect. The river is cold after the warmth of the holt, and the cubs are very reluctant to get their feet wet. They seem torn between fear and the desire to follow their parents. After a great deal of persuasion, the youngsters reach the water's edge, and that, it seems, is quite far enough. No amount of enticing or bullying will lure the cubs into the river just yet. It could be days before they'll finally take the plunge. They have little time. A distant rumble signals an end to the drought. The otter cubs must have learned to swim well before the rains flood the river. Clouds roll in from the Atlantic Ocean laden with moisture. The rains fall gently at first, enveloping the forest in veils of mist. 
It's the prelude to the storm. There's an air of celebration as the rains refresh the land and replenish the river. In a few days, the banks are splashed with colour as spectacular flowers wake from the dry season. Orchids are common here. These are epiphytic species. They use trees for support, but take no nourishment from them. During the rains, the rivers overflow their banks, flooding the forest and the surrounding savanna. The fish move back into the flooded forest to feed and spawn, and the otters pursue them. For the next four months, the otters return to the impenetrable jungle where they'll be free for a time from persecution by fur hunters. The Rupununi region is still a refuge for the giant otter. At 80 kilometers away, across the border in Brazil, the otter population has been nearly destroyed by hunting and the destruction of its habitat. A new road is being built from the interior of Brazil to the coast of Guyana. It will open a way for commerce, but also for hunters, fur traders and foresters. Very soon now, the giant otter sanctuary could become yet another killing field. As in all South American forests, the chainsaw has replaced the axe. A forest giant, which may have taken 200 years to grow, can now be felled in as many seconds.
Logging is still not widespread in Guyana, but it's increasing. The world is greedy for wood, and the government needs the revenue. Habitat destruction and river pollution will follow the loggers. The giant otter needs all the help it can get. Dianne McTurk's efforts will have little effect on the world population of this beautiful creature, but at least the groups which live on her ranch have a chance of survival. Lovely to see you both. You had enough swimming and you wanted to eat him. You had enough swimming and you wanted to eat him. In 1989, she successfully released two adult females into the wild. During the rains, as otters will, they disappeared into the tangled forest. Five months later, she was told that both animals had been killed. But two months after that, she was delighted when the two otters returned, hungry but healthy. yet learned to fear people and it's remarkable that they're still thriving. It means that the local Indians are listening to Diane and beginning to respect her feelings for the otters. still, the females returned with two unknown males. The males tolerate their mates' bewildering behavior for short periods, but then give voice to call them back to the wild. In the following dry season, one of the females gave birth to two cubs. Diane McTurk is campaigning for the Guyanese government to declare this part of the Rupununi region a wildlife reserve. It's only a tiny fragment of their former range, but it would be just large enough to offer protection and hope for the surviving giant otters. So far, however, she is their only guardian. <laughs> 